Hello and welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to tell you about my coaxial cable pass-through port. Welcome back and thanks for being here. My name is Scott and some of you have been waiting a long time for me to share about this pass-through port. Some hams have these at home. They're made out of wood or plexi or something. Sometimes it's just as simple as using a piece of pipe insulation or a swimming pool noodle. And when it comes to roving, VHF contest roving, especially temporary setups, I think a lot of hams do that. I, I know I started with it. I had three or four uh, cables to pass out the window. So I just use a piece of pipe insulation. And given how long I was leaving my setup on the car, sometimes just days, but sometimes weeks at a time, I wanted something a little bit more tidy and perhaps a little more sturdy and durable. And so I switched to this setup. Before I take this out and show you how I made it, I'm gonna give you an exterior tour to tell you what I'm using it for. I have eight ports on the panel, and that's because I enter in VHF contests as what's known as a limited rover. So that's the four lowest bands of the VHF and UHF spectrum. So that would be 50 megahertz, 144 megahertz, 222 megahertz, and 432 megahertz. So I have eight ports for that because the top ones, when I first built this, were for loops, the bottom ones for Yagi's, and now I'm kind of experimenting with, do I need loops and Yagi's? A, a weird mix of them, all, none. I'm still fiddling around with that. Eventually, I could just decide to go all Yagi's and have 50, 144, 222, 432, 902, 1296, what would this one here be 2.3 and then 3.4 gigahertz? I might be messing those up a little bit because I'm not very well studied on that, but that's the idea is I can get up into some really high bands with four outputs. And I even have two more pre-drilled in here. They're just kind of little markers so I can actually still line them up and put two more ports in here if I want. That's what's going on here on the outside. My ports, I'm gonna see if I can show you this up close. I'm kind of thinking it's not gonna work so well, but these are all type in ports because they're waterproof. So what I have going on here is, uh, this is just plastic. I will link to the exact product that I use for this. This is 3 16 of an inch. And gosh, pardon that airplane. They all come out when I decide it's time to record and I just gotta keep going. It's raining the rest of the week. So here we go. 3 16 of an inch plastic here. It's textured on the outside. I think it looks pretty good. And then I'm using a 1 8 inch sheet to sandwich over top of the glass. And I'll pull that out here in a second. These bolts, they are not going through the glass. I get asked that quite a bit. So no penetration. I wanna say the glass is about right here. So good quarter inch below. These bolts are just holding everything together. I have a bead of glue all the way around this. I can't remember if I put it straight through here or not, or if I just put it around the bolts themselves, but there is glue inside of here. This is water resistant, not waterproof. I do check every now and then I see some little drips on the inside of the glass right about here and here, and that's just from well, I mean, it's been raining for the past several days and there's no new drips inside of the glass. So the water droplets happen when I wash the car. If I happen to spray directly on my fitting here and then a, a little bit, a little drop will get past there and come down here and probably evaporate before it even makes it to the floor. So we're not talking about a lot of water. Going to the inside of the car, let me go ahead and show you how this works. What I will point out the window is rolled up again to about right here. I've actually blocked out. This is probably the most important part of the mod. I've blocked out my window control at the driver's seat because how many times have you gone to a drive up window or something and you press one of your buttons, the wrong window rolls down. When that happens here, it creates quite a mess because then I have to get out, reposition, very carefully put everything back up so that I don't interfere with the window's anti-pinch protection or would that be pinch protection? 
Anyway, the most challenging part of getting this in is rolling the window up without it hitting the kickback feature that will then knock it back down to the bottom. So let me go ahead and open the door, show you how it all comes together, pull it out and show it to you. All right, so for the sake of uh, maintaining my picture here for you, I am gonna go ahead, this is just a, a Volkswagen accessory screen. I use this for a little bit of privacy. And also, it's just kind of organizing things a little bit. So let me pull it out from this side. I don't usually do it from this end, but it's, so it's a little bit more of a challenge, but I wanna stay out of the shot. All right, there we go. Got that off and out of the way. So here is the inside of the connections. These right angle adapters, they do add perhaps a little bit of insertion loss, but I'm doing that to keep everything nice and tight to the door so that when I open and close, everything works properly. This, I'm not gonna remove these because that it's gonna to take too much time. So let me just go ahead and roll down the window and show you what happens. So when I roll down the window, I'm gonna kinda of go slow and in small spurts. All right, so you can see that it kinda of stays up in there. And then to get it out, I bring this down. And let's try to pull this out of the way. And then I just have to kinda of flex it to get it out of the gasket there. And here we go, out of the window. So let's see how well you can see that here. So you can see that this is the piece that goes into the window seal. I don't know how well you can see that little line there. We're not up here at the top. We're not talking about a lot of travel up into the gasket. And then this here is just part of the sandwich material. And then you can see the space that I have that is for the glass to go up into. And then this is sandwiched together to keep it from flopping off the glass either one way or the other. Now, if I were to want to remove this right now, I wouldn't actually remove it. I would just take it out like this and then toss it into the car like this. So it would just go right in here and then I would shut the door and then roll up the window. All right, so now that the door is closed and I am showing you, basically it's inside the door can close and that is how I stow it because I use that pass through often enough to where I don't ever completely remove it and disconnect everything. So let me go ahead and show you how it gets put back in. I'm gonna do this a little awkwardly because, well, I've got cameras and I need to stay out of the way, but I'm gonna go ahead and just reach through here, grab it and just put it back in. It might look a little odd from that direction, but this is the way it works, check this out. All right, so I bring it through to the outside. I need to bend it a little bit. To flex it into place. Now I can either push it up like this and then roll the window up into it, or it is a little bit easier sometimes to get it on the glass first and then roll the window up. Right here is where it's critical because much higher than this, it's gonna hit the anti-pitch. In fact, I'm gonna do it on purpose just to show you what it does. Okay, it's, it's in place right now. But if I bump it one more time, oh, it didn't do it. What luck. Oftentimes that is the end of my luck. Once I get it up in there a little bit, it will just pop right back down. I don't know what happened, but I'm gonna take it. It's a win. Something I didn't share is how I formed this. I'm sure many of you have seen those window deflectors that you can put in here so that you can bring the window down an inch and then rainwater will run off. Uh, we call those uh, 
wind deflectors, rain deflectors. They might be called something else where you live, I don't know. But that is what I used to trace the shape of the top of this. And then the shape, the same shape is at the bottom because I'm trying to contour it to be shaped like the glass. And then I have a belt sander. Oddly enough, I bought my belt sander just for this project so that I can then shape the glass exactly the right shape. And then it took a lot of trial and error to get this piece here cut properly to where it fit on here. Same thing with the inside because the outside piece and the inside piece are shaped differently. Lining up all the screw holes, gluing it all together. It just took a little bit of doing. Is that custom or is it just a hack job at home? Home brew is a lot of hands like to call it. So uh, yes, trial and error. I think this would be a fantastic idea on say a pickup truck with a the rear sliding window because those windows tend to be much more square, um, rectangular, however you want to say it. I think they'd be very easy to make for those. They could even be mass produced for pickup trucks since they're so prevalent in the United States and because they're square, rectangular, no weird contours like on every make and model of sedan and hatchback. Maybe that could work for somebody. But otherwise, if you've got a, a, an unpopular car for ham radio, especially like my GTI, you're gonna have to make this on your own, but it really isn't that hard. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm always glad to answer stuff like this. I have an article with more photos that I can share. I've been sharing some photos in the video anyway. Huh, let me go inside and see how the birds and the noise and the cars and the dogs and everything else sound in my video here. I don't shoot at home very often. As always, I appreciate you being here and I will see you next time. Take care.